my sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Now hear the result. It is well with my soul. Open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. Beginning back in chapter 24 of the book of Exodus, God called Moses up into the mount and showed him a pattern. Now let me tell you what the pattern was. The pattern was a person. The God speaking to him. Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, was revealed to Moses as our Savior, our Redeemer, that one by whom alone salvation must be accomplished and showed him how it would be accomplished. And he said, now you make the tabernacle, all of its furnishings, all of its services, all of its garments, all of its sacrifices, all the coverings, make the tabernacle according to this pattern. I want you to build a tabernacle and carry it through the wilderness with the children of Israel and wherever the children of Israel camp, set up this tabernacle. And in this tabernacle, I'm going to show you how redemption and salvation is accomplished by my son. And everything in the tabernacle was built according to the pattern. And when you get to the end of the book of Exodus, you'll realize that this tabernacle, we think of it in all of its details, and this is astonishing when you think about it. It was so designed by God that one man alone could set it up in one day. One man by himself could set it up in one day. And that one man who accomplished redemption in one day by which he put away sin is Jesus Christ our Lord. Now here in Exodus 30, Moses is given instruction concerning specific things about the tabernacle. First, in verses 1 through 10, you have the altar of incense. And then in verses 11 through 16, he speaks to us about atonement money. And then in verses 17 through 21, a laver of brass where you had to be cleansed to go into the tabernacle. And then in verses 22, uh, 22 through 31, or 33 rather, the, you have the holy anointing oil. And then in the end of the chapter, verses 34 to 38, Moses is given instruction concerning the incense, the sweet perfume to be made for the offerings at the tabernacle. Now let's look today at verses 11 through 16. Here we're given God's law concerning the numbering of the children of Israel and the atonement money they paid so that no plague would come upon them. They were numbered. They had to all pay a certain atonement money and the result was there would be no plague among them. The title of my message, if you're taking notes, and I always encourage folks to take notes, a certain number, a certain price, a certain result. A certain number, a certain price, a certain result. And here we have a marvelously instructive picture of the redemption and ransom of our souls by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read the text together. Exodus 30 verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord, when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them, when thou numberest them. This they shall give, every one that passeth among them that are numbered, hath a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty giras, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered from twenty years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make atonement for your souls. 
And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and shalt appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord, to make an atonement for your souls. Now listen carefully. We believe, we rejoice in, and we preach without the least apology the glorious gospel doctrine of particular effectual redemption, limited atonement, to be specific and clear, limited atonement. I know I've been told all of my life as a preacher, you ought not use that, those words, limited atonement, that's confusing. It's not at all confusing. The reason I use it is because it's not confusing. Well, that offends people. That's the reason I use it. I don't, but I'm not at all bashful to offend folks who are offended with God. The scriptures teach, and we preach without the least apology or embarrassment, but rather with fullness of joy that Jesus Christ, our Lord, when he died at Calvary, died for his elect, all his elect, and only his elect. And having died for them, he accomplished the ransom, the redemption, the free forgiveness of sin for our souls by his blood atonement. I defy anyone, I defy anyone to find any place in the book of God that even hints at the possibility that Christ shed his blood for all men without exception. That Christ died to redeem those who perish under the wrath of God in hell, just as he did for those who are saved by the power of his blood and the power of his grace. Where does the word of God proclaim an atonement that doesn't atone? A deliverance that doesn't deliver? A redemption that doesn't redeem? A ransom that doesn't set free? A savior who doesn't save? Nowhere will you find such nonsense in the book of God. The fact is, everywhere in this book, in every place, in every chapter, in every verse, in every prophecy, in every picture, in every type, which speaks of the redeeming work of our Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary, every portion that has any reference to the death of Christ and his accomplishments at Calvary, it is limited to a specific people who receive the benefit of his death. Everywhere in the book of God, there is not a hint that Christ died for folks who are not saved by his blood. In our text, the ransom money for atonement was paid for a certain number. We read the sum of the children of Israel. A certain price was paid for those specific people. The price for their ransom was a half shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. And a certain result followed. Those who were redeemed according to the requirement of God's law had no plague among them. Now let's see what the scriptures teach us here. I want to make five statements from drawn directly from these verses of Scripture in Exodus 30, five statements that are so obvious, so plainly revealed, that no one can fail to see them except those who refuse to see. Are your eyes open? Read the Word of God with me. Here's the first statement. None were redeemed except God's chosen, the children of Israel. All the children of Israel but none except the children of Israel were redeemed. The children of Israel were numbered with the adult males of the nation from 20 years old and upward who had left Egypt. And they made up a specific number for whom this atonement money was paid. We'll look in chapter 38 in a little bit, but there Moses tells us that there were 603,550 men. That's a pretty specific number. 603,550 men were numbered, and for those 603,550 men, a shekel was given for their atonement. The children of Israel were a chosen people. They represented God's elect in this world who are called the Israel of God. 
Now when you read the Old Testament, and you read the Old Testament types given with regard to the nation of Israel, and the laws given with regard to the nation of Israel, and the promises given with regard to the nation of Israel, and the covenants made with regard to the, nations of Israel, the nation of Israel, don't pay too much attention to folks who are telling you to look across the water to those folks over there in the Far East in that little place called Israel. That's not what it's talking about at all. That's not what it's talking about at all. Those people existed only as a representation of those who are called the Israel of God, the whole church of God's elect in both the Old Testament and the New, Jew and Gentile, all the way back to Genesis chapter 7. The Lord God spoke of Shem and Japheth, and Japheth shall possess the tent of Shem. It has always been God's purpose that Israel of the Old Testament typified and all the promises made to them represented promises God has made in covenant mercy to his Israel, all the body of his elect. That's who God's Israel is. How we ought to rejoice in God's electing love. Listen to the, how the Lord describes it for us in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Don't turn there for just a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Election. What a blessed, blessed word. Election. Deuteronomy 7, 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and Girgashites and Amorites and Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Look down at verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, separated by God from everybody else. That's what that word holy means. Distinctly pulled apart from all other people, distinctly identified as a separate people from all others. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee. That's the reason for it. He's chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Now, I used to apologize, folks. So you, you, you folks believe in election. Don't you believe you're a special people? I said, oh, no, 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 no. And, but, well, yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> special to God. God's special objects of love and favor and grace above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because there was something in you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. He didn't have anything gained by you. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage of the bondman from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. Who? This God of free election. This God of mighty redemption. This God who makes worthless sons and daughters of Adam to be his own holy sons and daughters. He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God's election is just this. In eternal love, God chose us in his son. He chose us before the world was made, <clears throat> having chosen us in Christ. The Lord God, the triune Jehovah, heaped upon his chosen all the blessings of his grace and all the glory that we yet anticipate in everlasting life. Imagine that. Before the world was, Cheryl, God chose you and gave you everything God can or will give to a man. For time and eternity, all spiritual blessings heaped upon us once and for all with finality in Jesus Christ the Lord before the world began. Now listen to me. Election, according to this book, is the source, the fountain of all blessedness. Blessed 
Blessed is the Lord God Almighty, for he has blessed the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even thy holy temple. That's God's election. That's God's grace. Accomplish and given us in Christ before the world began, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. This is God's salvation. This is God's work. This is God's gift. This atonement money, back here in Exodus chapter 30, was paid for the sum, that is for the total number of the children of Israel. And Christ Jesus, our Redeemer, made atonement for and redeemed all his elect. Only his elect and all his elect, the sum. The total number of the Israel of God. It is written in the scriptures. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Our Lord Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That's the first thing. Now here's the second thing. This ransom price was determined by divine measure. Those who were redeemed were redeemed with a half shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. The measurement of the silver by which atonement was made was not man's measure. It is called specifically the shekel of the sanctuary. In other words, God's demands were measured out by God. God's demands were measured out by God and they were exacted by God. And they were paid to God. God said, this is what it will take to make atonement. I take the atonement. And the Lord God Almighty says, I take the atonement that I have paid. Here's the measurement of the sanctuary. The precious blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. God says, this I will take. I will take nothing else except the precious blood of the spotless Lamb of God, the incarnate God-man, the infinite mediator, our Savior Jesus Christ, and I pay the price. The Lord Jesus was alone when he tread the fierceness of the winepress of the wrath of God. But don't ever imagine that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost were not together in this. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Well, the Todd read it to us in 1 John. What is the very life of God? This is the life, Jesus Christ the Lord. And God gave his life in the person of his darling son for the ransom of his people and God accepted the life he gave. <clears throat> the redemption price was a re redemption price that met all that was demanded by the law. It met all that God demanded. Not only did the Lord require that they must each bring a half shekel, no more and no less, but it was called the shekel of the sanctuary, not the shekel of commerce, which might be debased in quality or diminished by wear and tear. But the coin must be according to the shekel standard laid up in the holy place and determined by God himself. Verse 13, to make sure we knew the measure, we're told a shekel is 20 gerahs. We bring to God the redemption that God has appointed the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood, nothing more and nothing less. Bring less and you die. Bring more and you die. You bring to God only the precious blood atonement of his son. The ransom price is perfection, perfect righteousness, 
and perfect atonement. Perfect obedience unto death. This is the righteousness of the saints. From that price, there could be no varying. Would you be accepted of God? Would you come to God and be found accepted of Him with God looking upon you with approval, with approbation, with delight forever, with God receiving you and accepting you? Come to God with nothing but Christ the Lord. His obedience unto death by which he in one day put away the sin of all his Israel. The price satisfies the demand of God and satisfies it to the full. And the price appointed effectually redeemed all for whom the price was made. Now there are multitudes who blasphemously imagine and preach that the sacrifice Christ made upon the cursed tree, he made for everybody, but really didn't accomplish anything by it. He made the sacrifice for everybody, but didn't really redeem anybody. He made the sacrifice for everybody, but didn't really justify anybody. He made the sacrifice for everybody, but didn't really sanctify anybody. He made the sacrifice for everybody, but didn't really save anybody. And they trample the blood of God's darling son under their feet as a contemptible thing, an unholy thing, a common worthless thing. For they declare that man by his faith makes the blood effectual for himself. And thus declare that Jesus Christ is no God for he's a failure. And that man is his own savior for the determining factor is man and not God and not Christ. That's blasphemy. That's not, that's not a variant form of the gospel. That's blasphemy. You may as well worship a totem pole or worship yourself. That's what it really is. It is man being set up in the house of God, demanding that men worship him as God. It's called Antichrist. And that's what all Arminian free will, will worship, works religion is. It is Antichrist and it's damning. You trust such a Christ, you'll go to hell as surely as if you trusted in a postage stamp. He's worthless. That is not the Christ of God, nor the gospel of God. We preach that the particular and effectual redemption of Christ was for God's own chosen, his elect, exactly as it is revealed in the book of God. Nothing else honors God. Nothing else sets forth God's faithfulness and justice. Nothing else sets forth God's mercy and his grace. Nothing else sets forth God's righteousness and his truth. Only by the satisfaction of divine justice through the merits of an infinite sacrifice, Jesus Christ our Lord is God honored. And nothing else gives hope to sinners who have nothing. I'm preaching to you who have nothing. I mean, all there is you've got is your sin. That's all. And you've got nothing to bring to God but your sin. Nothing. How can I come to God an empty-handed, naked, filthy, bankrupt, doomed, damned, worthless sinner pleading Christ alone? Ah, now, there's hope in him. And only in him for sinners who have nothing to bring to God. As long as you think you've got something to offer, you may as well stay away. You're not welcome. And God will send you to hell if you come some other way. All those for whom the atonement money was paid were freed from the possibility of plague when the children of Israel were numbered. All of them. Now listen to me. I just caught Daryl's eye. You've had a few bumps and bruises along the way. Nothing's ever done you any injury. I remember when you didn't have to use that stick. <laughs> well, he got to walk with Cade now. No injury. No harm done. No harm done. I've had, uh, I've had cancer. I was born with a bad defective heart valve and 
I walk, somebody said, you walked a little slower this morning. He said, yeah, pace has slowed down a little bit. I don't spring up quite like I used to. No injury, no harm, no harm. Listen to the scripture. Either, the, either that's true or God's not, one of the two. Listen to what it says. There shall no evil happen to the just. There shall no evil happen to the just. Well, don't you think sickness and pain and, and trials and troubles are evil? Oh, not for the just. Not for the just. They only do us good. They only do us good. And when we finally escape from this world, this body of death, by breathing our last breath, <laughs> No, no evils happen to the just, only good. Listen to what our Lord says. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. No plague come nigh thy dwelling. You see, my dwelling place is not at 2734 Old Stanford Road, Danville, Kentucky, 40422. No, 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 no. I'm just staying there for a little while until I get to my dwelling place. <laughs> Our dwelling place is in another land. Our dwelling place is in another place. Our dwelling place is God our Savior in heaven's everlasting glory. Now what, what was it that you said was evil about this? What, what harm has ever come to this? God's elect being ransomed according to the atonement money God requires, shall never know evil. Shall never know evil. We only read of the children of Israel being numbered, totaled up twice in the Old Testament scripture. You're familiar with the passage in 2 Samuel. Turn to Numbers chapter 1. You go ahead and turn to Numbers 26. I'll just read a couple of verses in, in Numbers 1. The children of Israel were numbered once as men commonly try to number them today. Only being inspired by pride without atonement. Without atonement money. David being lifted up with his pride had the children of Israel numbered without atonement money. And as a result, God killed 70,000 of them. But if you look here in Numbers, you'll see the numbering of the children of Israel again. Let me read to you the first two verses of Numbers 1. That's what the book of Numbers is all about. This atonement, this accomplishment of redemption. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month, in the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum, that is, total up all the congregation of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles. Chapter 26, verse 2. Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, from twenty years old and upward, throughout their father's house, all that are able to go to war in Israel, and Moses and Eleazar the priest spake with them in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Take the sum of the people from twenty years old and upward, as the Lord commanded Moses, and the children of Israel went forth out of the land of Egypt. Now, turn to Revelation chapter 7. I read of one more numbering of the children of God, the Israel of God. A numbering made by atonement. A numbering, bless God, that shall soon be performed. In Revelation 7, we see the children of God, God's elect, God's Israel, numbered by atonement, saved from every plague. Verse 4, I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Multiplying the twi tribe by twelve, it comes up with all the tribes, 144,000. Now, 
back before they got to be a big cult, the Russellites used to say there's just going to be 144,000 saved altogether. And now they've had to change the doctrine a little bit to keep the money coming in. But uh, that 144,000 is not talking about a literal number. Not a specific number. It's talking about the whole body of Israel. All the tribes of the children of Israel. Gathered out of all the four corners of the earth. Out of every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Let's see. Verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell down before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And which came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> Complete atonement Christ has made. And to the utmost farthing paid whate'er his people owed. How then can wrath on me take place? I'm sheltered in his righteousness and sprinkled with his blood. If Christ has my discharge procured, and freely in my room endured the whole of wrath divine, payment God cannot first demand, first at my bleeding, twice demand, first at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. Christ's atonement means that no plague shall ever come nigh but only grace and blessedness and glory. Now here's the third thing. Back here in Exodus. Paul speaks in Romans 3.25 about faith in his blood. Faith in the blood atoning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, our substitute. So the third thing I want you to see in our text is that all the chosen, all for whom Atonement money was paid, or was paid. They brought the atonement money in their hands. They, uh, they came and said, here's, here's my half shekel. Every one of them. Every one of them. They brought the money to Moses, to the law, in the tabernacle of God, at the place of God's glory. Even so... God's elect, all of them, must and shall come to God by faith in Christ. Through faith in the accomplished redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now not many folks in this world believe that. Not many do. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. We who are gods believe that that man, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived better than 2,000 years ago in poverty, and that man who was scandalized and mocked and derided and at last falsely accused of horrid crimes and nailed to a cursed tree, spit upon by men, forsaken of God, and slain by the sword of justice, and then on the third day rose from the dead, triumphant and victorious, that man accomplished everything God in the prophets said the Christ would accomplish. He left nothing undone. Redemption accomplished by him. The atonement price had to be personally accepted by the one who brought it. And we must come to God only on God's terms. Trusting Christ alone as our Redeemer. Him who is a price of infinite worth. 
And yet a price that could be obtained by the poorest men in Israel. <laughs> but I don't have I don't have a half a shekel. I don't have a half a shekel. Where can I get a half a shekel? I've got to have a half shekel. Where can I get a half shekel? That ain't like asking fella for a thousand dollars. A half shekel? Brother Todd, I'm busted. Would you, would you leave me a half shekel? Why, sure, Todd. <laughs> Even the poor can get it. All they've got to do is beg. <laughs> All they've got to do is beg. All they've got to do is beg. Cast yourself a poor, helpless, bankrupt sinner before God, and God's going to do something for you that's symbolized in the scriptures that men keep trying to imitate and they can't do. It's called alms. It's called alms. You give you a free gift. Free, full salvation through the gift he has given you, the half shekel of the atonement. Even the poor can get it. And all who come have got to bring this in their hands. The atonement money must be personally brought by the worshiper. How can I speak to you as I should about this? Oh, Spirit of God, help me to plainly, truthfully speak to your heart. You must trust the Lord Jesus Christ, God's darling Son. For yourself. You must do it. But preacher I've tried and I've tried and I can't. I know you can't. I know you can't. But you must. And if God calls you by his grace this minute. You will suddenly find yourself. Gladly doing. What you could not otherwise do. Believing on his son. <laughs> you bring God the atonement money. Bring him what God has provided. Bring him what God requires. Bring him what only God can give. You come to God by faith in his sight. Or by faith in his son. Now listen to me. You come to God by faith in his son. And God himself. Who cannot lie. Cannot turn you away. And if you come. By faith in his son. Bringing nothing else. And nothing less, you come with, listen to what the scripture says, full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. But, but I don't have that. That's because you're bringing something else. <laughs> you're mixing something else with, with his son. You're leaving something out. But you come with nothing but Christ. God cannot turn you away. You come with full assurance of faith. Do you imagine that Aaron was ever fearful on the Day of Atonement of taking that blood that God required from that animal that God required in the way that God required to the place that God required through the veil into the holy place there alone with God. Folks used to say, I've heard them say many times, they had on his robe bells and pomegranates so that if he died in there, somebody could know, know he's dead. And God hadn't accepted his sacrifice. He didn't even have those bells and pomegranates on in there. He pulled them off before he went in. He went in with the holy linen garments of the priesthood. And he went in with full assurance of faith. I wouldn't have dared gone in there without, without confidence, would you? Would have dared do so? Because he had what God required what God provided in the way God specified. And he came out and blessed the people with full assurance of faith. But if you come some other way, I don't care what it is, you come some other way without the shekel of the sanctuary, without the atonement money, you'll go to hell. No matter what you mix with it. That's what's declared to us in Hebrews 10. Now here's the fourth thing. And oh, what a blessed thing it is to see. Verse 15. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. All Israel 
was equally redeemed. And all the Israel of God are equally redeemed. What does that mean, Pastor? That means the Lord Jesus Christ purchased all his people with an equal price. The price of his own precious blood. They are all valued alike by God. All of us. All of us. God values me as much as does Abraham. <laughs> More than that. God values me as much as he does his own dear son. So it is with you who believe. All are equally loved of God. All are redeemed to the same inheritance. All are equally secure, bought with the same price. And all are equally accepted in the beloved. Accepted in Christ. So that God Almighty, in all the fullness of his glorious triune persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in all the glory of his infinite being, looks on Israel. All Israel, all the time, with complete approbation and delight. Did you ever notice when he speaks of David and the horrible crime with Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba? The scripture says the thing that David did displeased the Lord. The thing he did, not David. Because you see, we're accepted not by what we do, but by what Christ is and he has done. Accepted in the beloved all the time with no variation. Sometimes God hides his face and appears to frown. But even when he appears to frown, he's smiling on you. <laughs> this is atonement by the shekel of the sanctuary, by the blood of Christ. One last thing. Turn back to Exodus 38 now. Exodus 38. Everything in the worship of God. Everything in this thing called faith and salvation. Has its basis and foundation in the sin atoning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. You read the law of God given in Exodus and in Numbers and in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. Did, did you ever stop to look at how many times, in how many ways, with connection with how many sacrifices, the word atonement is used? Atonement, 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 atonement. All the time. Every day. Atonement, atonement. It's there all the time. Because everything in the book of God, in the worship of God, of faith in God, of acceptance with God, is connected with this thing called atonement. Atonement by the blood of Christ. Back in Exodus 26, all the boards of the tabernacle were fixed. Each board, sitting when the tabernacle was pitched, in sockets of silver. Two boards in each socket. And, and two, or each board fixed in two sockets of silver. Those sockets of silver connected all the boards together and formed the basis or the foundation of the tabernacle when it was established. So the boards were put into place. And all of them joined together. And these sockets of silver were like that, like that one pole shot through all the boards holding everything together. That's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now here in Exodus 38, we find out where the foundation came from. We find out where Moses got the silver to make those sockets of silver. Verse 25. And the silver of them which that were numbered of the congregation was a hundred talents and a thousand seven hundred threescore and fifty shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. A becca for every man, that is half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. For every one that went to be numbered from twenty years old and upward, for six hundred thousand and three thousand and five hundred and fifty men, all of the hundred talents of silver were cast the sockets of silver of the sanctuary, and the sockets of the veil, and hundred sockets of the hundred talents, a talent for a socket. What does all that mean? 
All the foundation for the worship of Israel was redemption. The dwelling place of their God was founded on atonement. The boards of incorruptible wood and precious gold stood upon redemption money. And the curtains of fine linen and the veil of matchless workmanship. The whole structure of the tabernacle. The whole structure of God's salvation. The whole structure of the revelation of the person and the glory of God. Stood on atonement made by the numbering of Israel. That's where the glory of God is seen. In the face of Jesus Christ crucified. So that in the house of God, in the worship of God, in the preaching of the gospel, in understanding the book of God, redemption is everything. Atonement is everything. Everything. I see atonement there. I see atonement over here. I see atonement there. I see atonement there. I see atonement there. Atonement everywhere in the house of God. What we bring to God is a half shekel according to the measure of the sanctuary by the command of God the precious blood of God's dear son and we come in and go out singing redeemed how I love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the lamb redeemed through his infinite mercy now, redeemed his child and forever I am. Oh, may God send you home today singing redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen.